Okay, so today we will be in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, and Lord willing, next week we will finish the book of 1 Peter. Uh, now last week we looked at verses 5, 6, and 7, and in verse 5, if you remember, it tells us that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And if you remember, this word for oppose is translated from the Greek word antitasso. And a word, this word means that it's to be in resistance to those who we are to be in submission to. It is to be in a battle against them. And if we go back to Genesis and the Garden of Eden, we all know that at first Adam and Eve were living their lives in submission to God. But then in chapter 3 of Genesis, is where we find in the story of the fall of man where Satan came and tempted Adam and Eve, and we all know what happened there. But before that happened, and we are not exactly sure when, rebellion happened. Lucifer, being filled with pride and wanting to be like God, chose to come against God and no longer wanting to live under his lordship. Satan was antitasso towards God and was kicked out of heaven, taking a third of the angels with him, and has been uh, in opposition against God ever since and his creation. Now, with Satan being in opposition with God, he has become the opposite of God, uh, of who God is, and his son, Jesus Christ. Look what this thinks. Jesus is good. Well, Satan is evil. Jesus is the giver of life. Satan brings death. Jesus loves. Satan hates. Jesus is truth. Satan is the father of all lies. In Jesus, we have freedom. Satan brings oppression. Jesus is a good God of order. Satan brings chaos. In Jesus, we have peace. Satan, no peace. Jesus is light. Satan is darkness. Jesus is our friend. Satan is our enemy. Jesus is our advocate. Satan is our accuser. And with that, let's read today's text. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Now this word adversary here is translated from the Greek word antidikos. It is a legal term. It is one who prosecutes another or brings an accu accusation against someone. And that is exactly what the devil does, doesn't he? But it's not just accusations, they are false accusations. The word devil is translated from the word diablos, and it means false accusing, accuser or slanderer. Satan is our enemy, he is a liar, and he is our accuser. Look what it says in Revelation 12.10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Wow. Mm -hmm. Satan is constantly accusing us. 
slandering us before God the Father. But the good news is, is that we do have an advocate. He is the best attorney there is. His name is Jesus Christ. Look what it says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That is good news, right? Amen. Back to verse 8. Here in verse 8, we see also a warning. Peter warns us of an enemy. He warns us of an enemy, and that enemy is the devil. And he equates the devil as to a roaring lion on the hunt. Now, I did a little research about lions this week and how they stalk their prey. When female lions hunt, they almost always do so as part of a pack. Like wolves, they use the numbers to bring down the game. Males, however, have been shown to rely much more on ambush style hunting as they, they usually will hunt alone. And as, this means that the males are much likelier to hunt like being in, like in tall brush somewhere, so they are being hidden. Now in today's text, Peter only mentions one lion, and what I learned is for lions to have success in hunting though, is that what they would do is that they would look for the weakest animal. And they also will find the one that maybe has strayed from the herd. So with that in mind, it takes us back to the start of verse eight. And Peter begins this verse with telling us to be sober. And the word used for sober is only used six times in the New Testament. But three of those times are used in the book of first Peter. And it means that we are to be clear-minded, not drunk, or intoxicated from the influences of sin. And then Peter reinforces this by saying, be vigilant, meaning we are to be alert and awake. When a lion hunts alone, he lies in wait and hiding in tall brush, waiting for his opportune time to pounce. That's how he works. And he is looking for that weakest link the one who has strayed. And if we are getting intoxicated, whether it is with alcohol, drugs, or being mastered by other sin in our lives, then we won't be alert, we won't be awake, and we will not be able to make wise decisions. And what will happen? We will become one of the weakest in the body of Christ. We will have strayed and will become the roaring lions easiest prey. This is why we must stay in fellowship. We must stay in pinnacle, especially, <laughs> and be accountable to one another, encouraging each other, because as they say, there is strength in numbers. Hebrews 10, 23 through 25. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. But even when we are staying in fellowship, we must take safeguards, continue being watchful, and here's why. Lions generally hunt in a pack and are very strategic on how they hunt. They will attack her, <coughs> excuse me, they will attack a herd and will cause one to stray. And then they will keep that one animal that has strayed occupied while the biggest lion comes and attacks from behind, taking him down. In the same way, the enemy sends packs of lions you might say, into churches. They are the ones who bring division. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and what does division do? It causes people to not be unified. <coughs> and then people are disgruntled, quit going to church, isolating themselves, making it easy for them to be devoured by the enemy. We, as Christians, must stick together and be unified. 
Psalm 133, 1 tells us, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And yes, you can know the song is probably going through your mind right now, so it is mine, but I'm not going to sing it for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> With that, being <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 9. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. We are to resist the devil, being steadfast in the faith. We are not to be afraid. But for us to resist him, we first need to be able to recognize him. The world paints the devil as some guy in a goofy red suit with a little pitchfork, right? But that is not what he looks like. We are told in the scripture that he can appear as an angel of light. And it is no wonder for his name when he was in heaven before the fall was Lucifer. It was Lucifer. And Lucifer means bearer of light. Then there are those that the devil uses to be wolves in sheep's clothing. They, they will secretly bring in and teach false doctrines in the church. So then how do we recognize it? Well, there are a few ways. First, is there any signs of pride involved? Is there any signs of pride involved? It was pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. It was pride that got Adam and Eve to partake in the forbidden fruit. It was pride that caused David to number his people. If we are being led by someone to do something that exalts us and not God, then that is of the devil. A good example of that is what goes on in churches today. The services are all about the best, how we can entertain the people that come there. It's all about the people. It's not about glorifying Christ. Another sign is, uh, is the truth of God's word being taught or is it being watered down. Satan is the master deceiver, and he will use false teachers to twist scriptures or teach scriptures out of context to advance their personal agenda. And the third thing, if, are we allowing anybody or anything in our lives that takes us away from our relationship with Christ? That is a scheme or a tool of the devil. And it could be any number of things. We have to be weary of that. Now, one more thing. The devil uses oppression. He uses oppression, and he can use it in a number of ways. It can be an unhealthy relationship. It can be our own pride. It can be jealousy. It can be doubt, low self-esteem, fear, worry, addictions, or regrets. And I know there's many others. But those are some of the ones I was able to come up with. The devil is crafty, and we have to be wise of his ways. And over time, as we mature in the Lord, we will become more aware of his tactics. And once we are aware, we are in a better position to resist him, to take a stance, to be against what he is doing. But most importantly, it says that we are to be in the faith, in the faith. We cannot do battle with the enemy on our own. Let me be very clear on that. We cannot do battle against the enemy on our own. If we try to do it in our own strength, guess what? He will destroy us. None of us could go and take on a lion out in, the, out in Africa, right? No, we could destroy it. <laughs> but look what it says in the book of Jude, verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, and contending with the devil, there's another angel, an archangel, contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a re re reviling accusation, but said, what? The Lord rebuke you. The Lord rebuke you. The devil is a very real and powerful being, and we are no match for him. Ephesians 6, 10, and 11 tells us, Finally, my brother, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you and guard you from the evil one. If we are in the faith, having Christ fight the battle for us, then we are more than conquerors, as the scripture tells us in Romans 8.37. We are more than conquerors. And in closing, remember Satan tempted Jesus at the end of his 40-day fast. Who remembers that? Mm -hmm. He did it when Jesus was at his weakest. But Jesus resisted Satan and defeated him by how? By using the word of God. Amen. But then, in Luke 4.13 tells us, after this all happened, now when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him, Jesus, and found an <coughs> opportune time. An opportune time. Satan does not stop after being defeated. Thank you, folks. We might win the battle today, tomorrow. That's all in the strength of Christ, that is. But he he does he will come back. And he waits for an opportune time and he attacks usually when we least expect it. So that's why we need to stay sober. We need to be vigilant and be ready to resist him from the Lord. The enemy does not fight fair. He looks for our weaknesses, weaknesses and he attacks. How many of you know that one? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He doesn't, he does not fight mm -hmm. fair. If I have a sore knee, guess where he's gonna, he's gonna kick me. He's not gonna kick me in the elbow, he's gonna kick me in the knee. <coughs> Look for our weaknesses, James, 4, 7, and 8 tells us, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Let me read that one more time. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We've got to be walking with God. We've got to be drawn near to him. I remember a guy telling me once, this is going back 30 years ago. He said, you know, if, if you're with if you're following Christ and you're real close to him, then I can't get hit. But if I pull away, now all of a sudden I become an easy target. Mm -hmm. and so it's very important that we stay, we stay there with God. And that takes us to our closing verse, everybody. First Peter 1 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living world through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that has not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Praise God. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for this message. Lord, may we. Uh, be sober. May we be vigilant. May we stand steadfast. May we draw near to you. May we remember that the battle belongs to you. It's not us. May we be awake. May we be uh, wise to how the enemy operates and when he's attacking. And Lord, when he does attack, may we not run, but may we stand firm in you and allow you to fight the battle for us. Father God, I'm thankful for our group here at Pinnacle that we have each other and we can pray for each other, that we can be strong in you together and be unified. <laughs> and we pray for our church that they would be the same. And pray for our staff, Lord, that your hand of protection be upon them as the enemy loves to come in and rob and steal and plunder. So God, may your hand be on us and keep us. We thank you and we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All of us chosen. Amen. Amen.